So uh, welcome. Uh, we're going to talk about uh, TypeScript.net, a uh, very, 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 very early stage uh, for, for game modding. But you know, you can do whatever we, you want with it. Um, uh, my name is Andrea Gaita. I uh, am the Editor Tools Tech Lead at GitHub. And formerly, I was at Unity and, and Novell and Xamarin doing uh, mono stuff. So uh, it's, it's been five years since I've been here, so this is fun, fuzz them. Um, OK, so let's get started. There are a lot of content, and I'm, I'm hoping to get through all of it, so, uh, so it's fun for you. Languages and game development. Uh, so um, game, games are like all other software built on, on tech stacks, on layers. You usually have, for most software, uh, one language, maybe two or maybe three. You, you might have some shell scripts for your uh, build system. You use one language to do your app. You might have some data languages formatting, like, you know, whatever, JSON, uh, other languages that are accessory, but you do it all on uh, one language. Uh, games are slightly different uh, because of the way of the disciplines that uh, building games uh, brings in. The game engine is usually on uh, uh, languages that, are, uh, that have facilities for aligning data in memory so that you can optimize putting pixels on the screen basically. Uh, not that these languages are better or worse than anything else. It's just like you can control how the memory is arranged, how the memory is layouted. You can send things to your graphics card uh, at, at the fastest rate possible. So you pick those languages. They're optimized for this. But you're making a game, and you're making it with there's game engine programmers, but then there's the gameplay developers, and then there's the game designers, level designers, scene designers, the technical artists, everybody else building content on the game. They might uh, have worked on the engine. They might not. They might not even own the engine. The engine is doing some things, and these people have to build content on top of it, which means the language that the, gets used in these, in these scenarios are not, is not necessarily the language of the game engine. You want to pick a language that is appropriate for the task that they're doing. Right? Uh, it's not about data alignment anymore in memory. It's not about the most performance and most fast. It's the one that's most expressive for uh, describing what's happening in your game. And a lot of these people in, in these teams don't have, are, not game, are not programmers at all. They don't come from a uh, programming context. So they don't even know how to code. But they can code. They need tools that they can use to express what they're doing with the game without learning, having a full CS degree. Uh, so in the game industry, this is very common. You have multiple languages building on top of each other to provide the best tool for each job, right? And while C and C++ is a, uh, very often on the game engine, C Sharp, Lua, Basic, Scheme, F Sharp, all of these languages that are expressive or functional or data oriented or have some other type of thing uh, going for them is the language that uh, the, everybody else is going to use to build the game with. Right? So there's the game. So I got interested in this topic back when I saw some slides from a talk uh, uh, about, uh, from Naughty Dog about how they uh, build Uncharted. If anyone has played Uncharted here, hopefully some. It's a game. It's a bunch of games. So uh, Naughty Dog is a Lisp house. They're very, very heavy Lisp fans. Um, and they really didn't want to give their designers C to script their game. It's not efficient. So because Lisp fans, they built a variant of Lisp, a, scheme, a, scheme, a simple scheme language to give their designers so that the designers could just focus on making, and, uh, making the game, reacting to events, talking to the engine, but not touching the engine. There's all of these advantages to having a completely separate scripting language that's running in a VM in, in your game engine. Um, like the engineering team doesn't have to uh, directly be involved. And in when in we talk about engineering, we're talking about people maintaining the engine. Doesn't have to be directly involved with the content creation for the game. Uh, code is data. Uh, it's easy to just change what's going on without touching the game engine itself. The, the game engine becomes more generic. Uh, it empowers game creators. And side effect it empowers modding communities. Because when you have a language that's completely separate that you use to build your game on, you can give that language to someone else to build, build things on your game because, because that's what you're doing. You're modding the, the engine. 
So it's just a side effect that it just becomes very easy to provide tools for modern communities to build their own content for the game. Um, this is the example that they have for their language uh, that they gave, and I, and I was very curious about this, so I emailed the, the pe person that uh, gave this talk asking like how, like, how do designers that have never coded before handle this? And it was like, they handle it just fine. They have no problems with this. They're, they don't have a background in programming. So for them, this is just, it's easy. There's no side effects. They just react to things, trigger things, stop and play. Things happen, and they script, literally script, the, the sequence of events that needs to happen whenever something else happens. They put things on screen, they attach scripts to things on screen, and for them, this is just, you know, a lot of parentheses, but it's fine. It, they don't consider this programming. It's just scripting. Uh, so that was interesting. And um, sometime later, um, uh, Neverwinter Nights, not, not that Neverwinter Nights came later, I just, I just uh, looked at it later after Uncharted. Uh, Neverwinter Nights came out in 2000 something. And Neverwinter Nights is an RP RPG based on D&D uh, &D 3rd edition, just usually multiplayer uh, RPG, but it has one key difference. Um, this is Neverwinter Nights. It is fully moddable, uh, as a lot of, of, of games are, but at, back then, not a lot of them were. And it has a full editor, editor shipped with the game. So now, this is available for the people that are running the game, not the people that are building the game. The people that build the game also use this to build a game. But this is shipped with the game. The thing with Neverwinter Nights is, when you're running the game, you can fire up the editor, create your whole campaign with all of the things that Neverwinter Nights uh, ships, like all of the assets. They give you license for all the assets as long as you're not making money with the assets. You have all of the assets, like all of the characters and all of the um, like tiles for, for terrain, everything. You have all of these, these things. So you can create a completely like, empty, empty space. You, you can build your own campaign just put all the, the scenarios together in the editor. And then you can script everything. Uh, so you can, you can basically go into any of these, uh, any of these um, objects that are in that area, and you can attach scripts to them. And the script is a C-like uh, language, basically, uh, that, they, that they have, uh, which allows you to make these things interactable. And then anything can interact with anything else, and anything can do anything. Which means you can just basically, you have a game, and, and, and you just make a new game out of it at um, runtime, <laughs> let's just say this, right? You're not compiling the game. You're just like, building this content uh, out of a shipped game. Um, it also has um, uh, like all of these things that you can edit. Um, because, you know, if they have the tools, they had the scripting language and they had all of these tools that they built to make their game, it's free for them to just give this to the users. There's no, no change, there, there's no overhead for them, there's no support that they need. It either works or it doesn't work. The interesting thing about Neverwinter Nights, and I'll get to TypeScript and AIL at some point, this is background for, for why I'm doing this, uh, is that not only can you do all of this scripting uh, at runtime, but the, the admin that's running the game, while the game is running, because this is a multiplayer game, so other, you can invite your friends to go into your server and play with you. Unlike like the same way that you play with multiplayer, but this time you're hosting the server, your control comes in and comes out, it's your game. Um, the admin that's running the game can go into the game while it's running and take over an NPC while another player is interacting with that NPC. Just override the entire dialogue tree of that NPC and start interacting with the player directly. And it's the ghost in the machine, right? Um, and it, they can make quests, like on, on the fly. Like, yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna make a quest for you right now, because I'm bored and I'm gonna run, run a quest for you, but I'm an NPC. And this got me really interested, because there's not a lot of games that do this. In fact, there's none. Uh, ne Neverwinter Nights is 20 years old. There's still people running Neverwinter Nights servers. Because, you know, when you can do that, it's fun. 
it's, it's a community, right? And, and we all know the popularity of Minecraft and, and other type of environments. Uh, it's about how you can modify the environment and interact with other people. This goes to a slightly next level, but it's an obvious next level. If you can control all the content and you're doing this at runtime, why not do it at runtime and control, literally override the system whenever you want. Um, but Neverwinter Nights looks like, you know, old. So, a few months ago, because of that, it was like, ah, they would be so much fun. We could do uh, like something like this uh, with better graphics um, and nicer, like nicer engine, right? Um, and and just side of not side effect, but uh, it turns out that most D and D uh, data, like all the monster descriptions and all the levels and all of these things, is but open source. Um, Wizards of the Coast open sourced D and D three point five and D&D &D, uh, 5.0. Not the names of the characters, like the, you know, the named characters, the bosses that you fight, but every single other data set, from magic spells to uh, names of creatures, like everything that you can find in a D&D book. All of it is under a license called OGL. Open game license. So it's all open source. Anyone can take the, that content and make things, which is how, um, forgetting the name, what the company, it, that builds out of that content is. There's a company that builds entire contents out of this because you know it's it's open. So it's like you know we have all this data, and we we can we can make this, and then we have Unity, which is a game engine that um, runs on C sharp and Mono. So you know we already have a VM that is uh, that can compile things at runtime and reload because that's what it does. We have a game engine that runs on top of this VM, so we can put all of this together and, and recreate what Never Winter Nights did with a modern engine, modern language, modern everything. Um, so, um, so we come into a uh, scripting system. Uh, at this point, I'm still thinking I'm going to use C-sharp for this uh, because, uh, because, because C-sharp is there. I know C-sharp. I've, I've worked on Mono. I, I, I know that part is easy. Doing a reloadable, recompilable system at runtime is easy. Loading all the data is hard. Uh, so, but then I had, I had this problem, which is why TypeScript. Um, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you the little silly prototype of the system um, running, so you can understand my problem. So this is a very silly prototype of uh, a thing that moves around. Uh, that cube is a trigger right there, uh, and this script is attached to it. Uh, this is the default content. It's not compiled yet, but if I compile it, um, I've compiled the script. I've reloaded all the data. Now, if the, my thing goes there, like it, uh, there's a bug. I don't know why it says activate instead of uh, yay, but in any case, it now activates because the script is is now attached. I recompiled the main and did all of this. This is cool. Um, and I mean, it's nice, like it's a one-liner, I can just do it. Um, anyone can go in and, and, and write code, but like code is not one-liners. When you're writing games, it's never one-liner. It's, you know, like get this object and do some math on it and do something or other and update this state or react. It's multiple one-liners. Uh, it gets complicated. And the problem with C-sharp is that the code that gets generated is, is actually uh, this. Oh, and that's why it's like that's why it doesn't say logger. It didn't actually generate the right code. It's this for that line to run, which should be in here, right? For that line to run, I have to have all of the scaffolding because C sharp requires it. This is what C sharp looks like, right? And now we, I have a new problem. Uh, if I just provide uh, the users with an interface to type a one liner, they can't do more than one liner scripts. If I give them all of this because they will actually need to define some helper methods or to pull in other things and these, these, all of these facilities that the language actually has, they can break everything. They can, it's, they're very easy to shoot themselves in the foot, like method signatures become complicated, like what do I override? It's no longer the language that I give a designer so that they can quickly react to events, right? Um, but if 
But if I go back and just give them, you know, like hide all the scaffolding, I'll figure it out somehow. If you take all of the code that you're writing in the little editor, put it somewhere else in an IDE, it's not valid C sharp code. Valid C sharp code needs this. So I don't get code completion anywhere else. For code completion, I need all of it. I don't need, you know, syntax highlighting all of these facilities. Th that is the reason why we use C sharp, because we have all of these things. So C sharp is not the best language for this. Um, and I looked at Lua and I looked at other languages, but I didn't want to. We have .NET, like mono, Unity runs mono and .NET. Like I have this. And then I uh, looked at TypeScript. And it turns out it's perfect because TypeScript is 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 a fully typed. It it can it can look just like C sharp in a fully typed mode. There's all type information, but it's flexible enough that it doesn't require all this scaffolding. So when you copy paste the entire code into um, VS Code, you'll get the type completion. And, and the language actually like, allows you to just go like, you know what, ignore type completion, but don't give me errors because I don't know what this thing looks like because it's JavaScript in the bottom. It types in TypeScript are a superset of, of what the thing actually is. Uh, and so it's flexible enough to be used for, a very, for, for people, anyone. There's a lot of resources online for people to use it. It is typed enough for me to take it and throw it in IL because I have all the types that I need to do this. Uh, so, then, uh, so then it comes to the, the things that then people, the, these, these are the things that designers uh, and people that are making code need to do. Like integrated VM check, like all of these things both C Sharp and, and TypeScript can do, but design, defining types is, is the thing. Right? In, in C Sharp, when you define types, you have to know what you're defining. You define classes and structs, and there's a, li a logic. And if you don't define them up front, nothing will work or compile until you do. There's no flexibility in the type system at all. It's type first and then uh, script. And TypeScript, it's script first and then type. You can go, you know, like, trust me, it'll <laughs> work at some point. It's fine. Which is, I mean, I mean, if the type is not defined at some point, it's not fine. But the IDEs will work. The IDEs will be very flexible, people not knowing exactly what they're doing up until the point where you run it. But at least when you're prototyping and building, the IDE is not getting in your way. It's helping you. And it's helping you learn. Because if you type one thing, it goes like, oh, I've, I've seen this before. Sure, I'll, I'll help you again, even though it doesn't exist. But I trust you, it'll always exist. So I saw all these things and thought, eh, TypeScript. Um, I'm going to skip, skip that all that. Uh, so these are the things that um, I ended up uh, with uh, for, for TypeScript. TypeScript is transpiler friendly. It's, a, it's not a real language. It's a um, facade on top of another language. That means it comes with full tooling for, uh, for IDs, for figuring out what the code is, building ASTs, because that's what it does. Um, and since we only have 10 minutes and I don't want to bore you more with talk, um, I'm going to leave you with the turtles and I'm going to show you some code. Uh, so th that was my you know, motivation for all of this stuff. Uh, so, so basically, Actually, I have another slide that I can put up. So basically what <clears throat> TypeScript gives you a uh, TypeScript um, namespace, TS. Uh, that's the, um, the namespace for the ASTs, compilers, parsers, uh, type checkers, and all of the stuff that's built into TypeScript. Like this is built in. You don't need to put in, pull in anything else. To actually get any, any code to be parsed by TypeScript, literally this is what you need to do. You just do create source file, give it in some name, throw in some code. You can read it off of disk, whatever. Uh, throw in some code and then tell it to transform. You implement a little visitor pattern that will get called for every node that it, the, the TypeScript finds. TypeScript will build this AST. For, that, for those two lines up, the, up there, this is, this is what TypeScript automatically gives you. 
It will give you calls for every single one of these nodes. This is a little tree. Source file has all of these nodes, and then it, you can go down, and you can decide whether to go down or not. I'll just, I just recursively go down by doing that, visit each time. This is the visitor implementation that I have. I go and I, I log what the node is, and I visit each child, and this is what I get. And that's literally what you have. Uh, so you can see this is not valid TypeScript, or is it? Does TypeScript actually care? Does the IDA actually care about this? It doesn't, because it actually thinks this is a property expression. It doesn't say this is gibberish. It actually says, hey, this is a, an object that has a property, and then there's another property. If you provide TypeScript with more context about what these objects are, TypeScript will give you better information about what they are, right? Uh, so TypeScript doesn't care. They will still think that this code, and it identifies the syntax, which is perfect, because now we can write uh, a class library access for .NET that TypeScript has no idea what it is, it won't complain, and it will give us type information and all of these things. And then what we get is, um, in, the, in this case, this simple line that TypeScript has no knowledge of. Uh, if, I, if I compile it into IL, you can see the, the tree that it, um, that it provided. I'm not sure if you can see that in the back, hopefully. Uh, those are all the nodes that I parsed, and I, I, I generate IL, and, and, and now we have .NET. Uh, and the IL that I generate is literally this, which is the equivalent IL for the TypeScript. Uh, so, you know, five lines of code, TypeScript compiler. It's, it's, you know, it, it's a bit more than that, but it's a good start. It was a good proof of concept. Uh, and, and this is what I, where I started from, to proof of concept, like, is this viable? Does TypeScript have enough type information that I can take this and produce a viable uh, IL from it? Turns out, yes, because Java, uh, JavaScript, is, there's only two types, string and number. And the TypeScript uh, JavaScript model is literally containers of key value pairs. It's a dictionary. Every time you access a property, it's literally going in and look at the table and see if that thing exists. If it does, it won't complain at you. So, you know, putting TypeScript on top of JavaScript, you can do because you can just build on top of the very simple string and number model, which is what they do with types. Taking that to C Sharp is literally just deciding. Uh, the it's transforming the syntax into IL, uh, taking TypeScript and .NET is transforming the, the, the syntax into IL and then deciding what is useful from the environment. Like TypeScript and JavaScript are not just the language, but they're also the ecosystem, right? JSON.parse and all of those methods that you just take for granted. They're not actually part of the language. They're part of the ecosystem that happens to come with the runtime that you're running in, in this case, V8, right? When you're running TypeScript in .NET, you're running in the .NET runtime. So you get the environment that .NET gives you, which is system console, system, all of these things, right? And now you just get to decide what type TypeScript that it makes sense in this kind of environment. You just, it's, it is just like literal .NET calls directly into it, or do you do some you know, node facades to make it look like the normal JavaScript that you would see, but under the hood you just call into .NET to do these things, which are helpful libraries that you once built, they're there and you never see them. These are the questions that I'm considering now, and then handling any when you have a type that is not a type, where TypeScript just goes like me, whatever, how do you transform that into IL? Do you just do like JavaScript and just make a dictionary key value pairs whenever you see property access to an any type, you just go and look up, you just create IL that goes look up into the dictionary, that's an option. Uh, you could use a DLR, that's an, an, another option for, for, and use dynamic as you would in C Sharp. So these are the, the, the questions that I have around TypeScript to .NET right now, and then for game-specific stuff, I have to actually pass data around, but that's for the game. Um, 
So uh, this was, like, this is a very last minute talk, so uh, the code is not up yet. Well, it is up, but it's not <laughs> ready for consumption. Uh, but uh, ping me, email me, uh, uh, because I, I really want to start fleshing out this thing, because I actually want, I need this for the game. <laughs> so, you know. Uh, and if you're interested, ping me uh, on, on Twitter or email me or whatever, and, uh, and I'll see about uh, putting the, the thing that I'm calling TSIL for now uh, up in public. Um, and we got, um, yeah, a few minutes for questions. We're going to set up while you uh, folks have uh, questions. Yes. <laughs> questions, please. Yes. Or not. What? Many people will just come up for questions. If they have them, yes.